Thanks for bearing me three days. I know it gets intense sometimes, but you know what? Today's the last day. We're going to actually have some fun and some kind of good discussion. Um, in the first 15 minutes, okay, I'm going to try to give a little bit of a summary of the last uh, two days and try to give a little bit of also some clarity about what our church believes. One of the things that I'm really passionate about is that I don't really believe that our church really adopts that of like, you have to be indoctrinated. Our church wants you to know and learn and be convinced. Do your homework, as I say, okay? And learn, and then when you make up your mind, and then if when we present to you our church stance on certain issues, this is based on information, is based on that you've done the homework and you've learned it, not just has been shoved down your throat. So for the last couple of days, I've presented to you really several alternative views about evolution, several alternative views about the biblical interpretation of Genesis. And I'd like to kind of summarize in this 15 minutes before we go on to this last talk, how does our church view this and why? Okay, and we've got good reasons for that. But in general, the first talk was about the worldview and is exactly as Shoy mentioned that we talked about how our philosophical worldview kind of dictates sometimes how we look at things. If you're a naturalist and you just believe in complete materialism, material is, all what you, is what you see, then you know what, no matter how much evidence I can give you for the existence of God, you're already biased. If you're a biblical literalist that you say that, you know what, I'm going to take it as literally, as verbatim as it says, then no matter what I show you, you're going to try to look into the science in a different sense. I think one of the hardest things that any one of us would grapple with which is one of the reasons why I've always tried to put myself in an ignorant, kind of humble position, is that being objective is one of the hardest things as a human being. We cannot be objective. We are very biased. And I'll tell you something. Being inside the church, yes, I'm biased. I'm biased towards the presence of God. Why? Because I am a theist. But even at times, I try to step out of my box as a theist and think as somebody who's outside of the church struggling with this. How do you think about it? Okay? How would you think about it in a relative sense? How would you think about it in a plurality of ideas? I'll make it very clear. Whether we like it or not, this world is a plurality of ideas. Yes, within the church, we have one idea. But we cannot deny that this one idea exists in the world of plurality. I don't want us to be, conf to be confused. I want us to do our homework and be very convinced with what we believe in. But when we, when we approach people outside of the church, we have to understand how they think. We have to understand their worldview. We have to understand how they view science, how they view the Bible. Because if we understand that, we can convince them otherwise. So that's very important. So that was the first thing, the worldview. The second lecture was about evolution. And as I said, evolution, it's mind-boggling the amount of research because I was just, you know, we had a, like a side chat here. In an area where you've got science that has biology, has genetics, has paleontology, has geology, has fossil records, has uh, biochemistry, has um, astronomy, has a lot of different disciplines. There is no single mind that can grasp all these facts and put them together. But then you, as an informed Christian, you have to kind of see and balance these information. I can tell you as evolution, I'll put it this way to summarize almost a full hour and a half of a talk yesterday morning. The genetic evidence of evolution from a common ancestry is very strong from the genetic standpoint, is not as strong from a fossil standpoint, okay? So from the fossil standpoint, there is a bit of question marks. From a genetic standpoint, there is a lot of really, really intriguing findings. I'm not saying it's conclusive, but it's definitely intriguing. And now come to the third lecture, which was how do different Christians interpret Genesis? And we talked about the concept of the days and how were the days six days and the young earth creationist or prolonged period. And I gave you different interpretations from different camps of the uh, church. When I mean church, I mean the Catholic, the Orthodox, and the Protestant church. And you would find that there are some very liberal views, okay, within the Catholic church, for example, within the Russian Orthodox church. And then you find some very, very conservative views. As I said, maybe about 40 to 50% of the evangelicals in this country are young earth creationists that believe that it's literally a six to 7,000 year period. And for that, they kind of, you know, they have their reasons. So it becomes a little bit more complicated when you talk about Adam and Eve. And I just want to go very, very quickly on the five 
quick possibilities of Adam and Eve. And it came down to the point of like, well, is Adam and Eve a historical pair? And out of this pair, all humanity came. And as I said, the biological data is a bit hard to comply with this because there are some biological, mathematical, computational models that say that based on our genetic diversity, I'm not talking about how we look, you know, Asian versus African American versus Caucasian, no. But the genetic diversity suggests that the ancient population of humanity was about 10,000 people and they lived about 150,000 years ago, which is not compatible then with an understanding of an original pair. And I said, within biblical studies, okay, um, the people come up with one of these four possibilities in addition to the being a symbolic, okay, that's a fifth interpretation. So then, what do we think of as a Coptic Orthodox Church? And it's clear to me as follows, and this is where I'd like to spend the next five, ten minutes and then move on to the last lecture. It is clear to me as a Coptic Orthodox Church in terms of orthodoxy, because orthodoxy has something really unique about it, that when you look at orthodox theology and compared with other like Catholic theology or Protestant theology, the orthodox theology is amazing in one thing, it is incarnational theology. We look so much at the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ and we look at this as the pivotal part of relationship between God and man, okay? And he took on flesh and this is a pivotal part. And because of this, when we think of that incarnation, we reflect back on Adam and we look at the image and likeness. This image and likeness is our Lord Jesus Christ. It was imprinted in, in Adam in some sense, he lost it, but then Jesus Christ came to restore it. Hence, when we look at the creation, I'll put it this way, for an Orthodox, it's impossible to separate creation from the incarnation of Christ. You see? And that's one of the reasons from a theological standpoint, from an orthodox theological standpoint, it's really hard to make sense of the rest of those options. For us, the option that makes most sense theologically is the first option. That they were a pair of people, Adam and Eve, that were created as a special creation about anywhere between seven to 8,000 years ago, you know, because sometimes there's a little bit of overlap in genealogies. But it's a recent creation. It's not 100,000 years. It's not 150,000 years. It's within the biblical time of 10,000 years, okay? And it was a special creation. And they were given a special status, a special glory. And they sinned, and they broke the relationship. Yes, is there part of the story it's hard to understand where's the Garden of Eden, is it physical, is it not physical? That's not the issue. The issue is that they were created for glory and they broke that relationship, they lost the relationship, and from there on we see the modern history. Okay? Why do we believe that as Orthodox? And I think this is the point that I really, I want you then to get convinced with. I don't think it's not only because of how we view the glory of man. I think it is a big part of related to the image and likeness. How do we as Orthodox inter interpret the image and likeness? Yes, some of us do look at the image of likeness involving us even as our own physical shape because we would say if God accepted to take our physical shape and our physical nature, it is glorified. It is not an animal nature. And that does have some sense in it. But I think there is more also, and, and this is the part that I think is really important, is the theological difficulty of can you dissociate the image and likeness too much from the way that we are and the way that we look? How does God participate in our creation? How does sin get transmitted? Because for us, when we look at Adam and Eve, sin was a break of the relationship, and after that, death came. For us as Orthodox, we do believe that Adam was created with a potential for immortality. It was not inherent in his nature, but he had the potential for it if he would have continued with that relationship and God would have given him the access to the tree of life. That relationship could have been an eternal relationship, hence sin caused a break in this relationship, spiritual death when that relationship was broken, eventually leading to physical death. And you notice here the sequence is very important. The spiritual death happened before the physical death, and the spiritual death is a much serious level than just biological death. Biological death, death is a consequence of losing the spiritual relationship. There are biblical challenges 
to group ancestry. And I think, so now as an Orthodox, in addition to your Orthodox theology, I think there are parts of the Bible that you have to really struggle with if you would not believe in an original two-pair creation, one-pair creation. And I think these verses are where we as Coptic Orthodox stand on as well as other Christian believers who believe in a special creation. So as I said yesterday, by the way, so you asked me how are you going to then interpret that with like the uh, prior ancestors that were there like 40,000 years. And as I said, as most common uh, argument that these ancestors, the Neanderthals, the caveman, the Homo erectus and all those were parallel lines of creation, not mankind as we know it in the biblical account. And for some reason that we don't know, they got extinct, just like other dinosaurs got extinct, just like other creatures got extinct. Do we know why and how for all of those? No, we don't. But was the Neanderthal, was the caveman, the biblical man that we talk of in the biblical account? No. The biblical man that was talked in the biblical account, which is Adam and Eve, was a special creation based on what we believe as an orthodox. And how do we come up to this point of Adam and Eve as the special creation? Well, number one, and now I'm talking from a biblical standpoint, this is the biblical ground you stand on. Because yeah, it is nice to be liberal in your interpretation of the Bible. But then if you're getting too liberal, you know, you're making some of these verses completely be meaningless. You see what I'm saying? You're losing the value. So number one, if Adam and Eve are not true historical pair from which our humanity came and from which Christ came, number one, what do you make of the genealogies? The genealogies that were mentioned in Genesis 7 for humanity? And then more importantly, in Luke 3, Luke 3 actually traces Christ going backwards all the way up to Adam. And then Adam, do you guys know what is he labeled? The son of who? God. The son of God. So then if Adam and Eve were not historical and didn't exist as a special creation, how do you interpret then the genealogy in Luke 3? Another very interesting verse. If Adam, and as I said, one of the interpretations yesterday that Adam and Eve were just the representatives of other people in humanity, which is, as I said, is an alternative interpretation. It is not the way that we interpret it as a church. How would you make sense of the verse in Genesis 2, 5 that it said that before any plant was there, before there was rain, and there was no man to till the ground. There was no man to take care of the ground. If you believe that there was a group of people that lived at that point, and Adam and Eve were just representatives of that, that verse doesn't make sense, right? So that's another verse that is really hard to reconcile with group ancestry. Another one is Acts 17, 26, when it says, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And, I always, and as I said this yesterday, this one is a bit hard because actually, anyone who's learned Greek, he knows that, you know, that word man does not exist. It's actually from one he made all nations of men. And different Bibles put in, insert different words. So as I said, the New King James and RSV actually say from one blood. The NIV and NASB put one man. And it's a big difference between one blood and one man. Very big difference. But still, that's one. And actually, a lot of Greek language scholars, when they look at this, say that Greek has parallelism. And the parallel, it says actually, it says, when one man he made all the nations of men. So because nations of men are there, that one becomes from one man. I think the toughest one of all, which is from us from a biblical standpoint, because for us as Orthodox, we don't just base our understanding only on our tradition. We base it on the biblical account. I think this verse is probably the toughest verse of all, how to make sense of it if it's a group ancestry, not a pair. Because it's very clear that Paul said in Romans 5.12, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. It's very, very hard to equivocate this. And as I said, the people, the groups who take a little bit more liberal interpretation of the Genesis account that it was a group, they would say, well, God chose Adam and Eve as a representative of humanity to introduce the relationship of God to them. As I said, it's a bit of a stretch and it's a little bit of a liberal interpretation. I think if you want to be very honest and truthful to the text, it's hard with this verse to deny that Adam and Eve were a special creation of God at that point. Okay? 
And all these other lines of creation that were extinct prior to modern time Adam were other creatures that could have been intelligent. There are, they've shown some signs of intelligence. They had tools with them, they had paintings, okay? But they were extinct a long time before modern man. Why were they there? I can't tell you. Only God knows. But were they the, the precursors of modern man? Based on this verse, I'd probably say no. Because in this verse, as it pertains to the relationship of man with God, it is clear that God created this man, pair, Adam and Eve. And through one man, they sinned, and through their sin, death entered, and after that, death became the norm of all the people that came after Adam. So Romans 5.12 is a very, very hard one to interpret in, the, in, a, in a sense of a group ancestry. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. And yes, I know that people would say, well, the last Adam that refers to Christ, Christ was not the last Adam. He's not the last human being. Okay? It means the first, it's like the, when they say the first and last, they mean the Alpha and the Omega. The first, the beginning of mankind was Adam who sinned and died. And the culmination, okay, the teleology, wherever mankind is going to get to, that's Christ. He's a living being. So sometimes this verse is interpreted in a little bit of a different sense, but still, what does it say over here? The first man, Adam. If one would hold to a group ancestry, it just doesn't make sense with, okay, so there was a group of 100,000 people, and God chose Adam and Eve to be the representatives of, of, of the humanity. What was the status of the rest of the group? What was sin to them? What was death to them? How were they judged? How was God even relating to them? And they would kind of, the people who would claim, claim and say that based on Romans 5.13, that those who had no law were not charged. But you know what? This one applies to the people at the time of the giving of the Mosaic law. It's hard to reconcile that with the Adam and whether there were other people. So I would say from us as an Orthodox church, we could, we definitely do agree with an ancient universe that is 15 billion years. We look at the days of creation that could be a prolonged period of time. We definitely look at evolution of biology, of marine creatures, of animals, of plants that could have happened, of dinosaurs that were there and got extinct. We could definitely agree and accept that there were semi-intelligent creatures that evolved over time, okay? And over the last 200,000 years were there and got extinct, whether it was Homo erectus, the um, Neanderthal, the caveman, whoever they are. That is very plausible because you know what? They existed. But when it came to biblical mankind, biblical humanity, that we are part of this group of people that the Bible addresses the message to, it appears to me from looking at the biblical text and our orthodox tradition that Adam and Eve were a special creation and a special creation that was given a special relationship with God, and Adam and Eve sinned, and that creation, and that relationship was broken. Hence, the theories of that it was biologically evolved, and then at some point, God gave them the spirit in the middle of all other humanity, I think is a bit of a stretch, and I don't think it does match what we think of as orthodox. Okay? Any questions on this particular point? I wanted to make sure to make clear that as I represented to you the different alternative um, viewpoints about the interpretation of the other churches, what do we as Orthodox believe? I want to read to you some of the uh, church fathers and what they wrote about this part. This one is from Sam Basil. Morning and evening then is a common boundary line of day and night, and similarly, morning is a part of night bordering on the day. In order, therefore, to give the prerogative of prior generation to the day, Moses mentioned the first limit of the day and then that of night, as night followed the day. Also for some basil, the earth had been filled with its proper fruits, for it had brought forth countless kind of herbs and had been adorned with various species of plants. However, the sun did not yet exist, nor the moon, lest men might call the sun the first cause and the father of light. So from Sam Basil's viewpoint, 
One of the reasons why the text would say that the sun was created on day four so that people would not worship the sun and say that it was the cause of existence. You remember when I talked about yesterday that how they were coming out of an ancient Egyptian civilization that worshiped the sun and they were going into a Canaanite civilization that worshiped the moon. And one of the biggest thing that Moses was trying to get to them, you should not be worshiping these entities. If the creation of light had proceeded, why now is the sun in turn to have been made to give light? At the first time, the actual nature of light was introduced, but now this solar body has been, been made ready to be a vehicle. So you remember the framework that I talked about yesterday, that light was created then as a body that carries the light was in the next day. So, St. Gregory, um, the theologian, talks about the creation of man. Thus we suppose that nature makes an ascent, as it were, by steps. I mean the various properties of life, from the lower to the perfect form. By the way, the Russian Orthodox would take this from St. Gregory the theologian in support of evolution of man. However, when you read it in its big chapter, okay, he's actually talking about it in terms of the glory. He said that God created the plants and then the animals and then the peak of glory was man. Not that it evolved like this. So this, is a, this, this, this actually text is a very interesting one that the Russian Orthodox take uh, as a support of that. St. Basil said, above the text says that God created. Here it says how God created. If the verse had simply said that God created, you could have believed that he created man as he did the beasts, the wild animals, the plants, and the grass. This is why to avoid your placing him in the class of wild animals, the divine word has made known the particular art which God has used for you. God took of the dust. So in order to avoid that you say that he came just out of beasts, that is Sam Basil. When we hear in the account of Moses that God took dust from the earth and formed man, we seek out the meaning of this utterance. We discover in it the special good disposition of God towards the human race. For the great prophet notes in his description of the creation that God created all the other creatures by his word, while man he created with his own hands. We do not say that the divinity has hands, but we affirm that every one of these expressions indicate a greater care on God's part for man than for the beasts. That's Sam Basil. So you can clearly get a sense that from an orthodox perspective, what we would say in creation is that God have created, he created the whole universe through biological means and that is very acceptable. But when it came to man, there was a certain sense of glory that would mandate a special creation. For that specific reason and all the biblical verses that I mentioned to you, I think this supports a special creation. When you look at this within the big camp of Christianity, I think we have a lot of people that agree with this. I think within the intelligent design, okay, they would say that God's creation of man is a special creation in of itself. So the story goes as follows. We look at evolution and we look at the beginnings. But then there's a big reason, why are we even fighting about evolution? Why are we even fighting about something that could have happened 8,000 years ago or could have happened 150,000 years ago? Why are we debating whether or not it's just a biological process or a process that God is involved in? And I think this really carries a lot of weight because you know what? A lot of times they tell you, your past determines your present and could even determine your future. The very first time when I talked about the worldview, I talked it's a matter of destiny, it's a matter of identity. It's a very big difference when you talk about yourself as a random chance that may or may have not have happened versus somebody who's coming and tell you that when I did the whole thing, I had you in mind. When the science tells you that you're just a random occurrence versus the Bible comes and tells you that before you were even created, as Jeremiah said, before you were even born, I knew of you, I appointed you. There is such a sense of a message there of glory that biology fails to give us. And I think this is very important because as you look at our past, present, and future, is it a God who's creating us or is it a random process? 
And you'll find that actually right now, and this, is, this one is going to really touch base on a lot of what we deal with. Because in the area of bioethics, we can take bioethics in of itself. Things that we deal with every day and almost have a full conference on it. But today I want to actually link the whole process of evolution, the materialism. Nature is all what it is, material is all what it is. And how we decide on very important matters in our current life. When you look in the area of bioethics, there are two big debates that are raging in the country for the last 50 years. The first debate is definition of life, how you define life. Is life the matter that you just have a breath in and out? Is life a matter that you've got a brain that is functioning? Is life that you're being put on a breathing machine and you can be kept alive? Is life started when a sperm and an egg are together and the potentiality of life exists. The second one is definition of personhood. Who is a person? If you just think of evolution and biology that you came up from just a bunch of cells versus you feel that you're actually you're a special creation of God. How do you define a person? Is a person, is a person defined by who he is regardless of what they do? Or is a person defined by what they contribute to society? As I mentioned in the first lecture, I find it, as I said, as much as I respect his writings, I respect a lot of what he brought to our community. I have a very hard time with a bioethicist, Peter Singer, in Princeton. He's, a very, he's probably one of the most prominent in the world. But I really find a very hard time that he says that a um, handicapped, mentally retarded person is less of a person than a chimp who has learned to do some tricks. That is very hard because that mentally handicapped, the weakest of all of us, as the Bible tells us, should be given glory more than any one of us. The weakest of all of us are a person. But the reality, that personhood, and especially, you know what the biggest promise in personhood is how our personhoods collide together. That's the biggest debate in abortion. Is the personhood of the mom more important than the personhood of the baby? Is the personhood of the baby dependent on the mom? Does it even exist? And you would find that actually from an evolutionary standpoint, why has this debate come up only in the last 50 years? Well, partly because the scientific and the philosophical debate has got to a point where people are now already doubted enough the existence of God. Have already made said that, you know what, we are making people. We are the origin of life. There's no God. So if I'm the origin of life, I can determine when life begins and when life ends. But if we believe that God is the origin of life, it's only God who determines when life ends and when life begins. You look at rules of ethics, there are actually about three schools of ethics. And in bioethics, there's one called deontological, which means that you do good for the sake of good. You're doing the right thing for the sake of the right thing, regardless of what happens out of that. When you decide not to abort a male, a, 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 a abnormal fetus, you're doing that because it is wrong to kill, regardless of what that fetus looks like. There's another school which is called the consequential ethics, which means that, you know what, what I have done, my action would be considered ethical or not depending on the consequences of that. Did I hurt anyone? Biggest example, just a very simple one. Let's say, you know what, you're walking in the street and you find in a garbage can, you just kind of, in the garbage can, you saw, you know, a golden Rolex watch in there. And you know what, there's really no one around, there's just, you know, it's already lost, it's dumped. Nobody even noticed there. And you would say, well, you know what, hey, you know, I, I can take it. There's really, there's no consequences because you know what, nobody is looking for it, it's already going to be thrown in the trash, it's going to be lost forever. So it's inconsequential to anyone whether I take this Rolex or not. So that's consequential ethics. There's virtue ethics, which basically tells you like, you know what, you decide what to do, not based on what is right or wrong, but based on what virtue it brings. Whether it's a virtue of charity, a virtue of courage, a virtue of goodness. And then last, which is really one of the biggest problems of our modern society, which is called utilitarianism. It's really hard, which is basically means that you make the utility, which is simply the, 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 uh, the means, just the ends justify the means. The ends justify the means. And if you can make the benefit of the good for more people, why not? The world judges ethics based on autonomy, 
benefit to all, non-maleficence, no harm, and justice, while we look at scripture, reason, experience, and tradition. Scripture, reason, experience, and tradition. So why is this an issue? Let me go with a bit of a story there. Most bioethicists in this country would tell you that the revolution of bioethics came in this country at the year and the moment that, bio, that contraception was introduced. Why? Because all of a sudden, this was the first time in the history of mankind, think about it for a second, by a scientific way, we as humans can control when and when not life starts. And all of a sudden, it gave us a sense of autonomy, a sense of like, you know what, hey, I can control when I have a baby or not. I can control when we're going to bring this child or not. That sense of control was new to humanity. Because prior to this, prior to the last 50 years, when people looked at when they would have babies, they would look at it as kind of, you know what, a divine intervention. When you'd have a baby or not, they would always think of it as a gift of God. But contraception was the first time in humanity that mankind would look at a way to intervene with God's plans. Mm -hmm.